Welcome to Introduction to Agroecology, Unit 8, Understanding the Effects of Environmental Factors of Soil, Soil Moisture, and Fire. And we're this time going to talk about the effects of soil. It's being split into three sections. On this uh, diagram here, it's just showing an example of the different environmental factors <clears throat> that we will be looking at and talking about um, in the atmosphere, there's wind speed, humidity, light intensity, precipitation and temperature, and no, looking at those factors and how they affect growth of plants. We're gonna be looking at water and soil, um, the pH and salinity of that, how much moisture is in it, how much dissolved nitrogen or nutrients and oxygen are in it, and then the structure and temperature of soil. Um, very quickly, um, we're going to explain um, how soils develop, and then within the development of soils, how we uh, categorize them into different soil horizons or different areas, uh, depths within the soil and the type of soil it is, different characteristics of the soil. And then we're going to look at how nutrients are absorbed in a soil. We'll talk a little bit about cation exchange capacity. Um, talk about soil pH and then talk about salinity and alkalinity in the soil. Um, we're also going to try to identify different ways in which to improve the soil and to make it more vital and in a natural way using soil management techniques. And we're going to also explain how water moves through the soil or doesn't as the case may be and how we might be able to optimize that use of that water through that um, movement of water. Um, we're going to start out by looking at lesson one for soil in unit A. Um, we're going to look for soil formation and development. Um, soil is a portion of, by definition, is a portion of the earth that is suitable for anchoring plants. In other words, we can put a plant in the ground and it's the right type of material that it will grow and it will nourish it and it will be a productive plant for us for some reason. Um, we're going to look at the different elements of soil, such as bedrock, how inorganic or organic substances <clears throat> from living organisms affect that bedrock. And then once that starts affecting the bedrock, we're going to look at how air and water in the spaces between the soil product or particles through freeze-thaw cycles will make a difference in the composition of, of and become and come to form soil from bedrock. Um, in order to look at uh, soil, we first should probably look at what an ideal soil would be considered. It is 45% minerals, 5% organic matter, and then the remaining 50% is split equally between air and water. And kind of interesting that there's that much, you know, air and water, there's a lot of space in there that isn't, that the growing part of the uh, organic matter is there organic matter, and that's only 5% of the soil. Um, it only becomes soil after many years from bedrock in, term, in terms of turning into soil. It's many, 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 many years of weathering and free thaw cycles um, using chemical and biological processes. So through the um, nutrients that are in the soil, the uh, that will changed it into through chemical and biotic pro, um, biological excuse me processes some of the things that will change how long it takes is if the bedrock is sloped um, the type of climate that you're in and the type of vegetative cover that you have if we look at the physical weathering that occurs um, bedrock is the source for all soil um, and with physical weathering through changes in the, in, with water, more or less water, more or less wind, the temperature being higher or lower, and then gravity moving rocks in the soil areas, that's going to all help in the physical weathering for it to change from bedrock into soil. Um, water will seep into cracks during those freeze-thaw cycles because as water freezes, it swells, and as it um, 
warms up, it contracts. Carbon dioxide um, from that water seeping into cracks creates carbonic acid, which basically pulls calcium and magnesium from the minerals in the rock to help form carbonates, which is part of the constitution of soil. And then it will mix different rock sized particles to allow further deterioration. In other words, those rock particles are brushing against each other and that will help uh, break down the into soil. Um, also in the formation and development of soil is how our soils, soils aren't all just in, they stay in place, they are moved by different methods. Um, there's four methods we're going to look at for these particles to move from one place to another. <clears throat> and the important thing is here is that there's four, they, they get moved in different ways. Wind can move it, that's called aeolian soil. If water moves it, it can be, it's called alluvium soil. If gravity moves it, if it's on a slope and it slides down, it's colluvium soil. And glaciers, when the ice uh, melts and moves away, it drags soil from one place to another. That's called glacial soil. Um, looking at, there's bi biotic and abiotic processes um, that make soil develop. And in terms of um, biotic processes, plants start to grow in the regolith, which is the bedrock. The roots are sent down into um, the soil also, and it goes down to find nutrients. In the rocks, there's also nutrients it finds. Um, deep root, root systems um, further break down soil as it goes deeper and deeper in, um, and different plants will go different depths. Um, organic matter is broken down um, through deep decomposition and mineralization, in other words, the different minerals mixing together uh, to create a humus. And then there are macro and microorganisms that will change uh, the formation and development of soil <coughs> by microorganisms um, eating organisms in the soil, depositing their excrement. They eventually die, creating more organic matter. And then the smaller microorganisms when they die, they decompose, and then bacteria and fungi occur. Um, here is a, a slide that shows the soil uh, horizons within the soil profile of soil horizons. Basically, if you look up on the left, there's O, A, B, and C that are listed here. Those are not all of the horizons, but they're um, four of the major horizons. Um, the top horizon O, which is the organic horizon, it's in the in this case here it's showing two inches. That can vary, but it's two inches in this case. That's the top soil. Uh, the layer underneath that is where the roots start forming on the plant, and that goes down in this case to about 10 inches. That can also vary. That's called the surface horizon. So it's not quite topsoil, but it's not uh, quite subsoil either. <clears throat> the B area is the subsoil, and that goes from about 10 to 30 inches in this example. So from 10 down to 30 inches, and you can see the roots go all the way down to, in this case, to 30 inches. And then from 30 to 48 inches, it um, is more, it's called the substratum, but it is not really soil that anything would grow in, it's, it's too hard to penetrate for, for most roots. So it's basically um, just a, ca a different category. It's, it's in the process of going from bedrock to be soil. It's just one of the areas that we can define easily. Um, there's a master horizon, it's called E horizon, and it will have a significant loss of minerals, and that's called alluviation. And then the last section, it uses the letter R for it, but it's the bedrock, and that's not soil at all, but that's where soil comes from. Here just shows you the different horizons. Um, it's you know important to know what the ones are, but basically O, A, and B are the three layers in which the plants are gonna grow. Um, the top soil we talked is the organic one. Um, all the minerals, um, that'll be mixed with humus or in that. So all of the NPK in that is what's going to be in that area for as long as it stays there, and that's where it's going to be pulled out of. Um, in the subsoils, it's when you get into the clay, it's the real solid part. When you're digging down, you see. Um, and it's full of iron oxides and aluminum oxides, 
Um, and aluminum oxides are the sulfurs, the iron oxides are the limes. Um, <clears throat> substratum is that area believe, below the uh, soils, and it's the least weathered and it's the highest bulk density. In other words, the pieces are the, the, the largest. Um, the master horizon has the least amount of minerals. It's the alluvial portion of the horizon. And then there's bedrock, which is that parent material, and it's not considered the part of soil. The soil texture triangle is um, all soil is made up of three components, or can, have, can be made up of three components, clay, silt, and sand. The percentage of each one determines the type of soil or the texture of the soil that it is. For example, if you have 100% sand, and if you look at sand, it's the bottom one, so it starts at no sand at all over on the right side over to 100% on the left side. So you can see if it's between 90 and 100% sand, it's considered sand. If it gets to between 80 or 75 and 90% sand, but then another portion, if we look here, it's above 10% of, um, hit the wrong button, sorry. If it's between um, 10 and, oh, I suppose about 15%, it's called the loamy sand because of the portion it has full from each of the areas. It has sand and then it has some of the silt. And if you go over here in the middle, that's where it's uh, basically a 50-50-50 proposition percentage-wise. But how it works is if you look at silt, that line goes straight across. So 10% goes over to 90, 20% goes over to 80. And I'm just doing it to show you where it kind of goes to. So you just draw a line across there. If you're looking at clay, it goes at a 45 degree angle from the top to the bottom, okay? If you draw those lines, the intersection and then the bottom for sand goes from the bottom left to the top right at that angle, about a 45 degree angle. Where those intersect, if you look at them, that's how you can determine which of these areas of this triangle that you're in. So for instance, if you have clay, you're somewhere between 50 and 100% on clay, okay? If you look at silt, you're somewhere between 60 and none. And if you look at the sand, you're somewhere between 45, I suppose that's a rough guess because it's, it's not quite at, at, or I should say 55, um, and 100% because that's that whole area and where those intersections would happen. But if the three lines intersect there, or they don't have a line because it's at 0%, then that's the type of uh, soil texture that you have. And that'll take a little bit of getting used to, but it's just based on the percentage of soil. And, and there is a process you go, we are not going to cover it in this class, but you actually take soil, you mix it with water, and you let it <clears throat> settle down. The larger um, particles will go to the bottom, the um, silt will go, or the clay will go above that, and the silt will be above that. And then you can look and just see what percentage of the total uh, of the soil you have and which one it is, and that's how you decide what type of soil you have. Um, the importance of this um, is that when you're looking at it, when you want to grow things, the best soil is something called loam, and that's what consists of uh, equal amounts of sand, silt, and clay. So that's 33 and a third percent of each one of those components, and that's what's considered loam. And that's the richest, it'll hold the best nutrients <clears throat> for the proper amount of time, and plants will grow the best. Um, in soil structure, it's the way in which those particles, the type of textures, are held together. Um, Particle sizes tend to increase as we go deeper into the soil profile, so that structure will be a little bit different as you go lower. Um, but a basic test for agricultural soil, in other words, what you're going to grow in, is you take a clump of that soil and you crush it in your hand. You put your hand together like a fist, and then when you have it together, if you can use your thumb and it breaks into crumbs, it has something that it calls good crumb structure. And if that exists, then that's good, um, generally, agricultural soil. Uh, you need that type of stuff, and that's what holds the plant in. If you don't have that, it's not going to hold it in as well. Um, types of different soil structure. 
it's basically just the different shapes you have. Um, when we talk about crumb-like, it has something that it calls good tilt, and that's the ability to break apart. Um, but it can also break apart too much because if you look at semi-arid, if it's prismatic or columnar, it's in the arid region, the sandy type soil. And in, in that case, um, what basically their, their article are, the particles are so large that nothing stays in there and it runs right through. In other words, it won't keep its form when you crush it especially if it's dry. It would be better when it's wet, but it would fall apart real easy when you got uh, more wet on it. Um, platy, everything, it's present in all horizons. There's a certain amount of, of platiness, and it's just the round disc shape in which the soil looks like if you looked under a microscope. It's not so important to really understand um, and remember all of the different types um, what's important, because you're never going to put it under a microscope, it's just important to know there's different types, and that's why water and nutrients stay in different fashions and different ways in the different types of soil. Um, soil color, it's important only to identify how much organic content is in a soil. It doesn't mean that if it isn't a dark color that you can't grow good plants. It just means that there's more organic content in darker soil than there is in lighter soil. Um, and generally that provides for the better nutrient, uh, uh, the ability to carry nutrients or keep nutrients in that soil. If you get a redder yellow uh, soil, it contains high levels of iron oxide. That's in uh, uh, Georgia that general area of the United States down there, and that's very fertile soil in a lot of those areas. If you have gray, yellowish, brown looking soil, it might mean you have poor drainage and it's just so sopping wet with water. And if you've ever looked in an area where water stands all the time, you'll see that, that colored look. You can also have a white light colored um, soil, and that's um, basically con it contains a lot of quartz, gypsum, and carbonate gypsum, is um, wallboard that we have the um, that we have gypsum board they call it drywall, um, but basically it just helps a farmer decide how or what they can plant. Um, looking at a soil, you can tell a lot about it. The cation exchange capacity, um, basically what that is, it defines how the minerals within that soil are going to be able to be dissolved into a form that's usable. Um, basically, nutrients are either positively or negatively charged, and where that becomes significant is if you have clay or humus soils, there's those plate-like structures we talked about are negatively charged. So what that means is positively charged nutrients are going to be what stays in the soil longer and could be potentially used longer. Um, the nitrates and the phosphates are the negative. Negatives uh, will not attract each other. And basically what that means is that's why nitrogen and phosphates go and leach out of the soil real quickly because they're the uh, negative charge as opposed, and so is the uh, clay, so that it doesn't stay because of that. Soil acidity and pH. Um, soils are measured um, using a pH scale that goes from 0 to 14. Um, with 7 being neutral, that's right in the middle. It's on a logarithmic scale. Um, we can, the old way of doing it, and you can still do it that way, is using litmus paper, and you put some soil inside with the solution, and you mix it up, and then you put in the litmus paper, and it comes out a certain color. Based on that color, it'll tell you what the pH is, whether it's acidic or whether it is alkaline or basic, um, non-acidic. Is another way you can say it too. Basically, if you go from seven down to zero on the left side of the scale, the closer you get to zero, the more acidic your soil is. Most plants will not grow at all in acidic soil. So uh, there are some plants that do like it, <clears throat> and you just have to look that up on what type of plants like it. So if you have acidic soil, either you plant plants that like acidic soils or you amend the soil to change the pH to get closer to seven. Because most plants like to grow in the six and a half to seven and a half range on the pH scale. If you go from seven to 14, the right hand side of the scale, 
that is where it's more increasingly either alkaline or they call it basic. In other words, it's not going to affect it as much, but if you get too close to 14, plants will be affected in that there's certain nutrients that won't be used, so they won't grow as well. So like I said before, you want to be in the 6.5 to 7.5 range. That's the optimal area for most plants to grow. Um, salinity and alkalinity. Um, salts in arid and semi-arid regions build up in the soils because they don't get enough rain, therefore they generally use a lot of irrigation. And when they do, when the um, irrigation is put on, as the water evaporates, the salt solids are left. Eventually you have a soil that has too much salt in it. When you do, um, it creates a soil that's not very good for growing anything at some point. So there are points you can wreck your soil. What you'd have to do is get rid of those salts, which is in a very, very difficult uh, process to do. Um, when you have alkaline soils, you can have plant development difficulties because the mineral uptake, we talked about that cation exchange capacity, it gets into the wrong range and therefore it's bound up, it won't let it go, therefore even though you have it, it won't take that, the plant cannot take it up based on the pH or alkalinity, and it will not be used. So you have development difficulties for the uh, plants. Um, on ways in which we can use soil management to improve fertility, <coughs> um, by constantly adding amendments or additions to your organic, uh, other organic matter to your soil. By doing that, it will help um, get a uh, improved fertility for your soil. Um, ways you can do that is you can keep the crop residue. In other words, when you harvest the plants, instead of um, taking out the corn stalks, let's say for instance, when you chop them up, you just leave them there and you use them for providing for more fertility, nitrogen. You can use cover crops that will add nitrogen back into the soil through the roots. Um, you can apply manure or sewer sludge, basically the same thing, um, that will add nutrients back into the soil. <clears throat> what you do have to be careful of when you're adding uh, manure that converts to nitrogen, if you put too much on, you could be uh, burning what crops you have because you have too much nitrogen in that soil. Um, you can also use compost, compost from farm waste or even around the house and yard. It could be grasses, leaves, that type of stuff. And then you can also use no-till practices where you can increase the fertility of the soil um, that you have. And this is a list of the attributions for this unit.